I got in with the wrong crowd and I started to um, pinch car.
we serve today. You heard your children, and you hear your children now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You answered prayers back. We just pray and thank you that you're the same God that we read about, Father, is still alive today. Maybe this moment, guys, I'd like to just bring our attention uh, as a church to probably a situation we've all seen on the news uh, of the war in Ukraine uh, with Russia invading. It's just crazy. After a crazy two years, this is the next thing. And you know, all through the scripture, we it's it's been said that there'll be wars and rumors of wars in the last days. And so, yes, we see that. But also, we also see that we should pray for the kings and the governors and and the rulers for peace. And so we're kind of stuck in this this middle ground, a a kingdom of now, but of not yet. God has not come and fulfilled his ultimate plan yet. But we can invite the kingdom to earth also. And so I just want to dedicate this time just to pray for this brutal situation, for these families, innocent families, just like you and me, and for the surrounding nations and and the world as a whole. Let's just pray that God would just do something significant, whether he brings peace, but even more powerful than that, that he would bring sight, spiritual sight. I don't know about you, but there's something about when we lose control in our natural, there's something it does to the supernatural. It, it reveals something. We realize that we can't control everything, and, and, and there's just evil in the world today. There's selfish, there's empires, there's sin. And so let, let's just pray for peace, but let's also pray for sight, that people will come to salvation, that they would realize that the world is not their own, and there's a prince of this earth, the devil is is trying to ruin, to wreck, to destroy. We're just going to ask God's supernatural peace, supernatural sight, 
for spiritual eyes to come. So let's go. If you feel comfortable, just go ahead and raise a hand as a sign of agreement. We're going to pray as a church right now. God, we just pray. We pray for those families. We pray for leaders in Russia and in Ukraine. God, we just pray for salvation. God, we pray that they would see you. Even in the midst of turmoil, God, we pray for provision. God, we pray for the greatest acts of love that those nations have ever seen in your name. God, we pray for the church to rise up. God, we pray, Father, for us to know what truly love is. God, we pray that we can play a part. God, we just pray for the children. God, that you would put your hand upon them and protect them. We pray for the innocent families. We pray for even the soldiers on both sides. God, we pray that you would intervene and bring peace, unity. But even more so that you would bring your love and your sight, God, that it would see that, God, that you are real and without you, humanity is doomed. So God, we just pray that you would come into the situation in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, I'll put our hands together for God this morning. Okay, you can go ahead and be seated. We're going to go ahead and release all of our youth. I'll put our hands together for the youth. Must... <laughs> Stephen, you must have some good biscuits up there. I'm going to go search up there after service. Um, okay, if you just pay your attention to the screen, we've got a great little video. A testimony video for Alpha just to show you right now. I got in with the wrong crowd and I started to um, pinch cars, burgle houses, uh, become known, me and my friends become known as very high profile thieves really. I used to carry big knives, uh, the, the big knives to the smaller knives down my waist and I was the kind of person where if you pulled a knife out I would use it. I ended up stabbing someone in the head. I ended up um, stabbing someone just missing his heart and going through the top of his shoulder, uh, the, the top of his chest and his shoulder away. He dropped to the floor and so I was on the run for two attempted murders. And then I was just, when I went to prison, I had such a hatred for the system and I couldn't handle being told what to do, couldn't handle prison officers mucking me about. When I went out on association, I got to prison officer and I, uh, I stabbed him. And then this led to me going into maximum security prisons, being put on CSC. It's where they feed you through a hatch in the door. There's no physical contact, so they have to have riot shields and riot gear on. Um, and that was my life for a long, long time, basically. And I, I just was going from prison to prison, prison to prison. But then I ended up going to Long Larton in Worcestershire. And when I was in there, I ended up going in an alpha course never heard of an alpha course, didn't know anything. And I just remember walking in because they'd sent me down, I sat down on a chair and I thought, oh no, it's a Christian thing. And we'd just go there every week and I would argue. And the pastor, um, I remember he come to me, he said, right, I'm gonna say a few scriptures first before we pray. And one of them was, no one's righteous, not one. We all fall short of the glory of God. And then he said the verses about Jesus and explained a bit why he died on the cross for sinners and stuff. And then he said, pray. So I started praying and I said, uh, God, I said, God, if you're real, come into my life because I hate who I am. And nothing happened. But then as I was talking to the pastor, I started to feel this energy feeling in my stomach. And it started to raise up and raise up and raise up and raise up. And I just broke out into uncontrollable um, tears. And I just sobbed. <clears throat> and I just... Right there. Because that was a change in my whole life. I knew God was real. Um, and no one will change that now. And then I remember <laughs> running on the wing. People clearly knew that I would become a Christian. 
So I actually helped them on another two Alpha courses. And then I, I, um, I got released. I've been in a prison where I, because you would have thought that the prison where I stopped the prison officers would have been the last prison to have me. But they were the first, that's how good works. The best thing for me is going in prisons and helping the lads in prison and, and trying to tell them about God. I've got um, four kids and then my life. Um, and what upsets me is because now I know um, that back then, if I had the kids, uh, they wouldn't have had a good upbringing. And now they sit on the night and have Bible studies with their dad. Um, <clears throat> have Bible studies with their dad. Have a life, a beautiful, um, and my life. And it's probably is my wife and my kids are the best gift, that, apart from the grace God's given me, is the best gift I've ever He'll ever give me. Didn't expect to cry like that. Recovered now. All right, what about that story there? I love stories, uh, just life-changing to see how a simple Alpha course could do that. So, hey, we had a great time last week at Alpha. It was a bit chaotic, but that's okay. Sometimes that's what ministry... I was reading that this week in our uh, Daily Breads, that sometimes ministry is chaotic. Jesus actually said to the disciples, hey, we should go and eat. We haven't ate in so long, so let's take a break. And it felt like that last week. <laughs> Some of us didn't get a piece of pizza uh, and so we're excited about tonight, real big topic, who is Jesus and why did he die? So listen, if you didn't come last week, you're still welcome this week. Uh, and oh, it's going to be fantastic and it'll be life-changing for anyone that attends every week. <laughs> um, so yes, we're going to move into a new series uh, called Love Does. Uh, there's a book my wife um, and Natalie have been reading, and honestly, I just stole the title. I haven't read the book, but I just thought it makes sense. Love does. Because I don't know about you, but I've lived life long enough to know that sometimes people might tell you they love you, or I might even say love you, but I don't always follow it through. And I remember you know, growing up, the big thing was if you had a girlfriend or maybe you had a boyfriend, you, you were, have you said, they, I love you yet? Have you said I was like, it's a big deal. So, you know, the love word wasn't really bantered about too much. And, uh, and it was kind of a big deal if you ever got there. And that was the kind of idea I had of love. And then I went across to America. And everyone's like, I love you, man. You're awesome. And I'm like, what? This is, what, what? This is what's going on here. Everyone's like, they're saying this all the time. So I was confused. They're like, what? What? What is going on? And the kids' ministry is off the... <laughs> losing the plot in there. Will someone go check on who's on sound in the kids' room? <laughs> and bring them in here. <laughs> I'm only kidding, William. Um, I'm always telling William, just tone it down a wee bit. Neighbors aren't going to take too well to that. Anyhow, the question, I was confused about this. And so I just want to, we're going to do a little exercise right now. So I want everyone just to go ahead and stand again. And it's a big question that maybe you have and I, I have, and it's this question. It is, what is love? Come on. Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt Come on, sing it like you mean it. What is love? Baby, don't hurt Come on. Let's go. You can dance if you want. All right, all right, all right. Getting right. Kids, take that. That's right. That's right. 
think you're loud. We can do better. So what is love? What is love? And if we're, if we're honest, sometimes we get confused ourselves because loving your dog should really be different to maybe loving your spouse or loving your brother. But sometimes it doesn't seem that way because we're using the same word, right? And so I want to explain a few things uh, around the word love. So when it comes to the word love, um, in the Greek, there's essentially, so the, the, the New Testament is essentially all Greek. Um, in the Greek language, there's approximately 20,000 words. In the English language, there's approximately 5,000 words. So you can understand that there's some words that we use uh, and they're not as defined. And so they can then be used as a more blanket statement like love, when really there's, there's more words for, for love in the English language, but we just don't have the word to use. Are you with me? And so I want to talk about some of the words that we see within the Bible, or in the Greek language at least, that represent love to us. And this will hopefully help you understand. I actually talk about this at every wedding that I speak at because I think it's really important. And you'll understand why at the end. So the first love is eros love. Eros love. Eros love is another word for maybe infatuation or, or exotic or, or lustful love. And that really was designed to really be within the confines of a marriage. So it's, it's not wrong. Yes, we might see it presented in, in wrong context and it's abused and put outside of that context of marriage, but it's supposed to be there, and it's, it's healthy within a marriage. Uh, we probably would have seen that in an unhealthy way with probably Samson in the Bible and Delilah. It, it was an infatuation, a connection, which led to trouble in the end. Uh, then we also have um, another type of love called stor storge love, and that's like a family type love, the way you love your family, you love your mom, you love your dad, whatever. Um, it's like a family, even within church, you might brothers and sisters, family type love. And then we have philia love, which is like an affection or intimacy type love between two people. You know, there's an affection there, there's an emotional connection there between two people. And then lastly, we have a love that some of us might have heard about uh, called agape love. And this is the, the love that we would hear people talk about being unconditional or Christian love, but I don't actually agree with that. Because it's nearly as if Christians have came in and tried to dominate the word. But when really the word is just a word that can be used in many different contexts, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. And actually, uh, Jesus actually spoke about it, how people had agape love for maybe money or for other things rather than God. So it's not really just Christian love, but it's mostly used in that context within the scripture. So that's maybe why they've said that. So I want to go into this scripture um, in John 21, and this is, I'll show you in the brackets where those different types of love are being used. And Jesus is talking to Peter. What's happened with Peter, as some of you know, the Peter, what did Peter do before Jesus died? He denied Jesus how many times? Three. And so he was telling Jesus, of course, I'm, I'm, I follow you. Of course, I'll do anything for you. Of course, I'll commit myself. Of course, I love you. And then he goes and what? He doesn't, love doesn't do, in his case, he, he denied him. There was no follow-up. It didn't really have much grit, the kind of love that he committed to. It didn't have the ability to face up to fear. It wasn't really that strong a love that he, that he was committing to initially because it didn't work in the face of opposition. And so this is what the Bible would say. This is um, Peter being reinstated back into ministry. Jesus is rose again. He has then met them in person. And this is what he says to Peter. In verse 15 of John 21, it's on the screen. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me, agape? So he's not just calling them to affection. So watch this. I'll explain this real quick. So out of the four loves, the first three are all, they all are derived a lot of the time from emotion. So like affection, if you have affection with some, you can't just have affection with yourself. It's affection with some, someone else, like a brotherly love or, or storge love. It's an affection with another person or, or the eros love is with another person. It's always to do with 
two people interacting with one another. So there's emotions involved. It's nearly like a give to get type love. And if both people give equally, then it's good. But if one gives more than another, then there can be a sense of rejection or, 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 or uh, a coldness from one and a hotness from, from the other person. So this is really important. But the agape love has nothing to do with emotion. It's different. Very different. And this is the kind of love that really we're committing to when we make a vow to marry someone. It, it's not, yes, the emotions are important. Yes, they're there. And yes, they're a part of it, but they're not the foundation. And that's what, where we sometimes get it wrong. And in today's world, did you know that love is up for grabs? The word love is up for grabs. And, and it's also closely a, attached to identity. Identity is up for grabs too. And I believe it's because a lot of us, we don't have a foundation or the world doesn't understand the foundation of what love was supposed to be. The Bible actually says that God is love. And so what we find in today's culture is, depending on how you feel, there's no real true definition of love. And so it's airy furry. And then it's also attached to emotions, etc., or then attached to identity. Depending on how you feel, you can be what you feel. And so what happens is we're up and we're down. We're left and we're right. We're not, there's no stability with love. There's no true definition of what love is, and therefore, it's unstable. It's chaotic. Would anyone agree? In the world we live in, things are not getting worse. I've spoke about this before. There's 112 official genders today, and that's associated with the mindset of love is love. But there's no definition. It's airy. It's not incorporated. It's not shaped. It's open, and it's actually destructive. And so, so when they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, son of God, do you love agape me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know I love you, Philia. So he's talking to Jesus as, with affection one-to-one. -one. Of course I love you, this interaction. But Jesus keeps calling him. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Interestingly, so he said agape love. So, so that deep-rooted commitment, non-emotional, just commit to it. And then he goes and then says, I want you to do this. So it's not, it's not just, I don't want you just to hang out with me and eat and, and have fellowship. I want you to go do something. That's the kind of love I'm calling you to. Commitment. And I'm not calling you to feed this. It, it didn't say, feed my sheep when you feel nice. It didn't say, feed my sheep when you're on the top of the world and you're excited about it. It just said, feed my sheep. And that stands despite emotion, despite feelings, despite ideas. He says, feed my arms. He says again, again, Jesus said, son of John, do you love me? Agape. Yet again, he's calling him deeper. Not just to emotion, but to decision, to commitment. Do you love me? Are you committed to me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And yet again, he's using this word of affection he said, well, if you do, then I need you to commit, um, take care of my sheep. Action. Love does. And the third time he said, Simon, son of John, do you agape me? Do you unconditionally love me? Are you committed to me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you agape me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I, Philea, you, love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. And so that word Philea, love, is probably appropriate with the interaction between Jesus and Peter because it's affection, it's, it's connection, it's brotherly, it's family. And that's correct. But Jesus' re his reaction wasn't, say, well, I love you too. Jesus was saying, if you love me, there's an action. If you love me, I want you to do this. And, and if you truly love me, you will do this. And so that kind of exposes that, that, that emotional, kind of more surface type love. Jesus is actually calling him to put a strong foundation down in their relationship. He's, and that's why when people kind of date and there's an affection type love, there's family type love and and there's, there's compatibility and there's chemistry and all those things within a relationship, then the natural thing 
to do is, hey, let's put a ring on it. Anyone here need to do that? <laughs> I'm not a Harry Bow one. And what, what are you doing? Like Jesus is calling it, you're putting commitment around it. You're putting a promise around it. You're putting a vow around it. And what you're doing is you're stabilizing the ship. You're setting it up for success by saying, hey, we're going to commit to something which goes deeper than just emotion that we're feeling right now. We're going to commit to something that goes deeper than just the infatuation, which might actually go up and go down. We're stabilizing the ship. And I think that's what Jesus was trying to do with Peter. Hey, remember you said you loved me before, but you denied me? There's a, new, there's a different way. It's called agape love. And, and what that also does, and this is what maybe I've subconsciously believed, is that sometimes I've seen agape love within the Bible. I thought, well, that's not for me. That's God's love. You know, <clears throat> I'm not God. I'm not Jesus. You know, have you ever used that? I'm not Jesus. Or I, that's why I was nasty. I was nasty because I'm not Jesus. What do you expect? I'm a human. We love that one, don't we? But you're, I'm only human. But actually, that's not, what God, that's not what Jesus is saying to Peter. He's saying, no, you can do it. You have the ability for agape love. You have the ability to, to have deep-rooted commitment. Can I get an amen? So let's pray. Today's message is called Whatever It Takes. God, I just pray and thank you that you call us to go deeper. And so, God, as we, we're called to go deeper, Father, help us to understand your, the greatness of your love. Help us to understand the commitment that we make when we follow you and the great reward and the great fruit we can produce when we do it your way. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus' language was one of cost, was one of sacrifice, and was one of commitment. That's what agape love is. Who wants to be connected to some friends who are willing to sacrifice for, the, for you, who are willing to stand by you at all costs, who are, who are willing to commit to you? Is that not the best kind of friend? Who, who wants to be a part of a team that are willing to sacrifice and go on the lines even at war? I think that's why a lot of people were really impressed with, even the Ukrainians were impressed with the president. Because he didn't say, the, the Americans offered him a flight out, and he says, no. <laughs> I'm leading by example. I'm staying. I'm loyal. I'm sacrificial. I will give my life for this country. You know what happened? The Ukrainians are now stepping up. They're like, if, he, if, if the top man, with all the privileges that he maybe has, is willing to stay and give his life for this cause, well, so am I. Maybe that's what Jesus is calling us to. Maybe that's the kind of love that God has called us to commit to. That maybe that's what agape is more, more about than just this feeling in worship or just this feel-good factor on the wedding day. Maybe that's what redefines what love truly is. Can I get an Amen. And so it says in John 3, 16, for God so agape the world. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. This was the kind of love that turned the world upside down, that redefined history, that fulfilled prophetic words. This is the kind of love that works and never fails. This is the kind of love that always shows up Despite the pain, despite the sorrow, what happened to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? He sweat blood. Why? Because he had agape love. It wasn't about feeling. It wasn't about, you know what he done? He says, listen, I'm feeling awful right now. God, I'd love you to have another way. But I'm going to go pray and dig deeper to find hope, to find life, to find connection with my heavenly Father who's going to help me to fulfill the mission. He didn't just go, it didn't feel good, so it mustn't be right. I'm not happy, so I give up. He didn't say that. He says, no, I know the truth. I know the way. I now have to find the heart. And I now have to find the power to fulfill my purpose. I think too often we, we fall for the lie of this lustful love. We, we fall for the lie of this happy love. That's not the love that Jesus called us to. I'll not go to church today because it's raining. What? 
<laughs> what love are you? That's not agape. That's not commitment to the body of Christ. Oh, I'll not go to group. I'll not go to. I'm not praying today. I've got a problem. I'm going to go so fix it myself. What? That's why I think things like war can sometimes change our perspective. Sometimes like a funeral or someone dying changes our perspective. It, it, it takes us out of that attitude of thinking we can do it ourselves. And we've got a choice to make. Do we try and do it ourselves or do we submit and surrender to God's way, to his power? This is what, I, I, I believe this, every trauma, every trouble that you will go through in this earth, you can come out better. I 100% believe that. But you can't do it alone. And you can't do it on your own power. And you can't do it on people's love. And you can't do it on your own way. It's only through God's love, which is solid as a rock. It's consistent. That that's makes the difference. All these other loves, if you find yourself on, on filia, filia love or eros love or, or storge love, all these loves which, which are two-way street, well, then if the person doesn't perform well that you're relying on, that's your foundation, you're going to get hurt, you're going to get wounded, you're going to get trauma. You're going to get bitter because what's the point? You're going to feel let down. You're going to be a victim. God's love's different. It's the kind of love that causes people to stand that were on the ground, that have fallen. It's the kind of love that brings fresh hope. It's the kind of love that brings life. It's the kind of love that gives us direction, that restores families. That's the kind of love that causes us to humble ourselves and to bow the knee. I remember hearing a, a guy, a very smart guy that I listen to on the internet sometimes, and he, he said this so true. He says he, he was in the process of becoming a, a, a Christian, but he was kind of very, very intellectual, and he was saying, one thing I agree with, with the Bible and the story of Jesus is that every man needs someone to bow to, to bow the knee, because what that does for the human psyche is it gives, brings and ushers in humility into the heart. Everybody needs a king to come under. It, the story fits perfectly for the human psyche. Matthew 5 and 46 says, If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that. So what is he saying? He's saying, the tax collector loves it. If you pay your taxes, I love you. Baby, thank you. I love you. But as soon as you cut off the quids, as soon as you stop that direct debit to my bank account, no longer, I'm not talking to you. Relationship's over. You didn't give me what I wanted. But when you give me the, give me 10, give me that 10 that you owe me. Oh, I love you. You're so amazing. You're the best. Tag you. I'll tag you. Let's take a picture of this, this interaction. So much love my, my wife has for me. Give me what you owe me. You see how that's so fragile? And he's saying, look, look what, you, th you think you're loving well because you're loving people that love you? Sinners do that. There's no power in that. There's no power to break any chains or, or break sin in our lives or dis destruction of sin to mend that. There's no power. It doesn't work. It only works while they behave well. It only works wh while they do what you want them to do. And that very quickly ends. See, agape gives even when it doesn't get. That's hard. <laughs> it's hard, especially if your expectation is to get. Like me and Anna, we struggle over the controller as it is. Never mind anything else. No, you had your show for 30 minutes. I want mine for 32. No. But I'm, no, I'm going to hide the controller. True story. And you know the problem is with Anna? She's actually quite strong. I'm like, don't make me do this. We're going UFC here in the living room. Don't encourage her, please. I rebuke that behavior. 
<laughs> and so there's a never-ending story until I says, you know what, we've done this before, I'm going to stop, I'm going to stop. We need to stop this cycle because it's only going to get worse. Have you ever seen that in your life? Where you keep playing, you like me, I like you, and then it just gets worse and you, get more, you feel more annoyed and more mad and more rejected and more... Like, why are you not doing that for me? I, I'm so used to having the controller by myself because I used to live by myself. And why are you not doing it the way I'm used to? That's what happens. But thank goodness that w- what we committed to was an agape love. We've got to, f- you know what that means? We've got to figure this out. There's a solution and we're going to find it. There's a problem and we're going to solve it. That's what agape type love does. It doesn't just run, I give up, you don't make me happy anymore, bye-bye. It says, no, no, we've committed to something and we better figure it out. And I promise you the best way that we figure things out is by humbling our heart. And how do we do that? We go and bow our knee before the king. We bow our knee before God, who is above all things, and we ask him for help, and he gives it every time. That is love. Agape love has the capacity to love without return. That's hard. It's impossible, actually, as a human to do that. Because I, I love this statement. If our greatest fear as human beings is to get rejected, can we agree with that? As hard as you might think you are, when you're not picked for the team, when someone doesn't say hello, I'm not coming back, we try to help you with a welcome team. But it's true. But we're trying to create an accepting environment. Why? Because if your, excuse me, if your greatest fear is to get rejected, your greatest need is to be accepted. And so it's interesting how Jesus walked the earth, somehow making people feel accepted, but also challenging them to live the way he had purposed them to. He challenged their identities, he challenged their sin, he challenged adultery, but but he accepted them in a way first. It was as if he disconnected their behavior from their identity. And that's why as a church we have to try and do both. We don't always get it right, but we want to try and create an accepting environment. Listen, we love you. It doesn't matter what you've done or who you ad- what, what you identify as. It doesn't matter. That's secondary. If we can get to your heart and, and show you that God loves you just as you are, then you start to experience a love that is stable. Because at the end of the day, a lot of us, we're trying to find love. We're trying to find love in unstable situations. Trying to find love in people who don't who need love themselves. We're trying to find love in areas that, that just let us down. Leaders included, people in church included, me included, I'll let you down. I promise you that, not, not intentionally, but it might come across wrong or I might say something the wrong way that doesn't fit with the way you're used to hearing things. And so life can be a mess. And that's why we point people to Jesus. Not to people, not to man. Amen. It says in John 15 and 9, it says, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. You see what's happening here is that Jesus is loving people because he was loved. It, it's, it's, it, he's not there to get love, he's there to give love. And the way he can give love is because he got love. So it's like pass it on. What do we do generation to generation? We're trying to pass it on. It's not about, hey, I'm trying to get it back. No, I'm trying to pass it on. I'm going to be consistent. I'm committing to love you despite what you do back. That's powerful love. That's consistent love. That's trustworthy love. If you love me, keep my commands in John 14, it says. If you love me, Jesus is literally, he's using agape again. He says, if you love me, then you you do it. Love is a verb. Love isn't, hey, I love you if you're nice to me. I love you if you say the right things. I love you if. The the love that we foundationally have been called to is to love because we've been loved. We passed it on. That means... That gives you serious capacity to love the unthinkable. That gives you serious capacity to love. It doesn't matter what's in front of us. We've been called to love it. 
It doesn't matter how ugly it is. It doesn't matter how rejected we are. We, if we truly understand that God has loved us and we keep going back to that love, which is always there and consistent every day, of, every minute of every hour, then it means we have the ability to love. What was Jesus doing in the Garden of Gethsemane? When he was stressed about his situation, it was ugly, it was brutal, he went back to God's love. Fred, God's love, fill me up, encourage me, give me strength, give me hope, give me what I need to say yes. And, and we have to do the same. Because life's messy. But God's power is infinite. God's grace is enough in our weakness. And that's why I was saying sometimes war exposes God's power. And his grace, why? Because it's weakness, it's human weakness, it's human mess, it's human sin. And God can move in special ways in those times. The church has grown the most it's ever grown in times of persecution. Why? Because we have weakness. We realize we can't do it on our own strength. So we actually then pray. We actually pray properly with full surrender. Agape love isn't based. Now hear me out. The other loves are important. They're God-given. We want them. We want them. In, in a marriage context, you want Eros love to be on fire. Fire emojis everywhere. <laughs> you want Philia love to be super strong within friends and family and Storge love to be super strong within friends and family and church. We want that to be on a high, but it's not the foundation. It's not why we show up. That's why the Bible says, let your yes be your... There's no room for emotion in that. It's just if you commit to something, you go. That's it. You don't have to promise. You don't have to use extra special words. Just you commit to it. Stay. And listen, God's grace is enough to help us have grace to learn. Listen, some of you are maybe thinking, oh man, I didn't do that right a few times. Or my whole life. That's why we have God's grace. To then turn from our wrong beliefs. Turn from our wrong mindsets. Maybe today is your day that you decide to believe what true love is. Matthew 6 and 24, no one can serve two masters for you will hate one and love the other, agape. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You, can serve both, you cannot serve both God and money. So watch this. The agape love can be used to love money. So it's not just Christian love. It's kind of inaccurate. The same commitment and the same drive can be used to love money. Well, let, give me an example. Um, has anyone ever woke up at 7 a.m. and not wanted to go to work? Yeah? <laughs> Every day? But because you're committed to the money, you show up. Has anyone ever... Woke up and couldn't, it was raining outside or the, it's sunny. Can't be bothered going to church. You're not going to be honest about that one, are you? And you didn't go to church. Or you didn't go to group. Or you didn't pray. I don't feel like doing devotion today. Because that's what dictates what I do. And then you don't go. You, understand, you see what I'm saying? What do you love the most in that scenario? Be honest with yourself. What are you more committed to in that scenario? What, what are you teaching your kids to love the most in that scenario? It's real. And this is why we've got to call it out because the, the devil deceives us into thinking, ah, it's all right, God's grace. We use Bible to work against God's plan. We use Bible to justify things which are not God's love. And to give us a Bible. I'm not saying if you're sick. I'm not saying if you literally can't make it. I'm saying generally speaking. Agape loved is based on a decision and not an emotion. And that's why you can understand at, at, at a wedding how I'm so, with, with, in today's world where, where maybe this hasn't been taught. Or, or yeah, I was talking to, we actually had a few counselors come in trying to compete with Thomas. Uh, from, from the government there. Where's Thomas? <laughs> um, I'm only kidding. But they were, came in on Friday 
and they came from a different uh, church background, and they kind of, they were talking about how in their pre-marriage course, it was not, it didn't happen, it's just, you just do it. And I could tell even from talking to them, I'm like, these people need help. <laughs> they were very open about, oh man, marriage is just, and I barely know them. And they were saying how was, I think that's what we need to do. It shouldn't be more, maybe they were used to the more like a dictator type of, of, of church culture or something. And just do it. They don't understand anything about it. Just do it. And so therefore they neglect some of the other kinds of love, the understanding their, their affection, understanding what it is to be a brother. And the, the, the Bible says without knowledge, people also perish, not just vision. And so you can it's, it's crazy to me how, how maybe we haven't, we've misinformed or we just haven't spoke about this, this kind of thing. And so therefore, we actually set people up for failure. In Luke uh, 11 and 43, it says, What sorrow awaits you Pharisees, for you love agape. To sit in the seats of honor in the synagogues and receive respectful greetings as you walk in the marketplace. So the question is, what are our seats and what are our synagogues? Where are we getting love? Where we're making that a foundational love where we get likes or we get respect and we've, we've made that our bottom line for life. Or, or where's the places that we get, but we're so desperate to get into a position, but why? Have you ever asked yourself, why do I want that position so much? Or maybe there's areas that we just need to, to surrender that because you can agape, you can put that in place of God. You can start to worship, even in church, maybe there's some people in here and, and you, see, you look at the front, you're like, oh man, they get so much love at the front. I want a position at the front. And what can happen is instead of worshiping God and trusting God and letting God do what he needs to do, you start to lust after positions where you think you're going to be loved. Instead of allowing Jesus to love you the way you are and where you are. And that's where character comes into play. Do you have God's love when no one's looking? Do you believe that God loves you when you're in a room by yourself? Because if you don't, maybe, maybe your love is for the synagogues and the seats. And maybe it's time to surrender that. Why? So that you can have a more stable love. God's love. Not people's love. I'm not saying it's wrong to have people's love. That's great. That's a part of interaction. That's a part of family. That's a part of relationship. But it can't be the bottom line. Or you're easily broken. Or that's why people get offended. That's why I get offended sometimes. Because, you know, it reminds me, oh, why am I so offended at that? And then I have to go back like Jesus in the garden to God's love. Oh, but God, you know the future. But God, the plans you have for me are in stone. And no weapon formed against me will prosper against the plan that you have as long as I walk in your ways. I'm just going to remind myself of some scriptures so that I'm stable. That I'm, I don't just walk away because I don't get my own way. It doesn't work out exactly how I planned. And we bow the knee again before God. Amen? So the issue isn't the synagogue or the church, the issue isn't the seats. The issue is who is first and what is your priority and, and what are you committed to first and foremost. And the beauty about it is sometimes when those emotions kick up of jealousy, of pride, of hurt, it actually is an arrow pointing to your foundation and it gives you the chance to reinstall a new foundation in those moments of, of, of hurt. Don't waste your hurt. Don't waste your jealousy. Don't waste those things. They're actually arrows pointing to a renewed mind if you let it. See, the level of your commitment often dictates the capacity of your love. The level of our commitment. I was, uh, went up <laughs> a few weeks, oh, about six months ago, I went uh, up to my friend's house um, in Bush Mills, and you know, my friends are just, they're fitness fanatics, I'm maybe not as fit as them at the minute, and they wanted to go, you know, what do you want to do on Sunday morning, or, or sorry, Saturday morning, I think it was, uh, let's go for a run, and I'm like, okay, just from uh, White Rocks just to Port Rush, yeah, is that it, I'm trying to understand, because I know my capacity is not too good at the minute, 
And yeah, yeah, I'll do, I'll do. And they just kind of brushed it off. I'm like, okay, you've committed to that. You better have committed to that. And so we start running, and I'm blowing out my... Uh, along the beach, the calves are tightening up. I'm like, oh, man, I hope they don't tighten up. Um, and then we get to Port Rush, and I'm like, oh, let's keep going, let's keep going. I'm like, no, you said. And they kept going, and we'd done a few, we actually do, ended up doing, instead of doing three miles, we'd done six. And the girls got to just drive. <laughs> <laughs> and you see, the problem was I wasn't committed to the six, I was committed to the three. And I was also trying to slow them down. And so because of that, I was looking to opt out. Honestly, if they asked me to go again, I'd say, I, I'm not going. I'll drive. <laughs> so anyhow, on the way back, the one thing I was excited about was getting into the sea because when you're roasting hot, I just love being in cold water. Um, oh, the plunge pool. We were, Anna got me the Galgorm for a Galgor, Galgorm retreat for my birthday. And I was, the plunge pool, anyone like the plunge pool? Not the going in, but the coming out. Oh, Delightful. I had to push Anna in and hold her down. <laughs> that was because she stole my controller, though. Um, and, and so we're on the way back, and the guys want to run, run back as they do, and I'm just, we're just surviving on the way back and near the car. And I says, all right, guys, let's get in the water. But none of them wanted to get in the water. And then I kind of convinced them to get in the water. And at the first wave, about three of them ran out. And so I just proceeded. Why? Because I was committed to get in. I knew what it would be like when I was fully submerged in the water. I knew the experience. I, I knew the impact it would have on me, my muscles, my body, and, and afterwards feeling so fresh. And because I had confidence and I trusted the water and its effect on me, I was all in. And I think that's the same thing when it comes to experiencing God's presence and, and a relationship with God's love. In the same way, Jesus, what did he do when he, when he faced his biggest giant? He went into a place of submersion into God's presence. He submerged himself in prayer, not just once, not just twice, but three times in the same way Jesus called Peter three times. Three is the, is the number for divinity. He pressed in hard enough until he could, could sense God's touch, until he could experience God's presence, until he experienced God's power. And see, sometimes that's the way we've got to look when we start to, to get into God's presence. We remember it and, and we go back to it and we face our obstacles not with superficial love or emotional love, but we go to a, a love that is grounded, that is permanent and never lets us down. In Matthew 5 and 44, it says, I say unto you, love agape, your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you and pray for them which uh, despitefully use you and persecute you. Well, how do you do that? You do that because you're passing it on. You don't do that because of what they do to you. You don't do that because of, it's not about emotion, so don't even bring emotion into the story. It's about obedience. If The Bible says if you love God, you obey his commands. It's not to do with other people. It's to do with God. And so, so what do you do when you see an enemy? You go to God. And you first realize that no enemy can prosper against you. That's the first thing you realize. The Bible says that no enemy will prosper against his plans for you. And so that they don't have to have it. You don't have to be afraid. It says he'll make a, a seat. It, it give you a seat at the table in the midst of your enemies. It's just... They can't impact God's purpose for your life. They can't change the course, so there's no point getting mad. Actually, if we actually look at it the way um, Samuel looked at it, his enemy trained him for his purpose. God actually used, as he said, in God's love and God's purpose, God put these enemies in front of, of David, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm getting mixed up there. In front of David, he put enemies in front of David to prepare him for his kingship. He actually maybe even needed those as a resistance to get stronger. And so what if we had that mindset when it came to God's love, Christian love? It was a love which isn't impacted by what's in front of it, but is impacted by who's behind it. And so some of us in here today, we're not forgiving. 
and you're being disobedient. And because you're disobedient and not obeying what God's commands, you're trapped in, in a snare, which is sin. And you can be free. All you have to do is obey. All you have to do is obey God's word and forgive. Not because of what's in front of you, but because of who's behind you, God. And as you do that, the weights and the shekels will fall. Guaranteed. 100%. But you have to obey. For there is no other way. It's awful quiet in here. Some of you are jealous of people in positions, in synagogues, in businesses, in, in the workplace. And it's not that you don't have, you're not abnormal to experience that. But God doesn't want you to keep that. And so God's way of blessing you in that situation and freeing you in that situation is, is to go to him, to pray, to read the Bible, to realign yourself and then bless, speak life over that person. Because they don't dictate your future. They don't dictate your next step. They, they cannot stop God's plan for your life. They're not an enemy in God's eyes. Maybe they're your preparation. Agape love does whatever it takes. Does whatever it takes to make it work. Goes through whatever pain. Goes through whatever turmoil. It's secure. It's safe. I don't know about you, but if you want to go to war with anyone, you want to go to war with someone who's got an agape love type of commitment because you know they have your back. No matter how many troops are in front of us, they will give their life to fulfill the mission. That's the love that Christ calls us to as we surrender ourselves. So, so when we go to share Christ with someone, maybe the, the Holy Spirit is prompting us. It's the kind of love, is it right, God, you've, you've, you've told me to share, I'm going to share. But I feel nervous, doesn't matter, I'm going to share. <laughs> it's, nothing, it's not in the equation of agape love. It's at, in the background. We bring agape to the front, to the forefront, and then we fulfill the job at hand. That's the kind of relationships God's called us to commit to. If there's conflict in friendship circles, well, who's going to produce agape love? Because whoever does that is the peacemaker. Whoever does that has got humility. Whoever does that is representing Jesus in the situation and leading the situation out of turmoil into peace, into provision, into prosperity. But it's God's way. It's not our way. Let's go ahead and stand. So some questions we can ask ourselves is how committed are you to family? How committed are you to God's house? How committed are you to your spouse? How committed are you to your neighbor, to your friend? How committed are you to the gospel? How committed are you to God? How committed are you to seeing children and the next generation carry faith in Christ? How committed are you to praying and spending time with God? How committed are you to leading by example? How committed are you to fighting the good fight? Maybe in, in here uh, you would say, Phil, I haven't really committed to that kind of love. Um, I, I haven't surrendered my life to Christ. I haven't decided to give it all. And maybe you want to do so right now. With every head bowed and eye closed, let's say this prayer, church, and help some of those people along. I'm saying this for the first time. God, I thank you for your love, your agape love for me. When you died on that cross, you seen me. I commit my life to you. I turn from my sin. I do things your way. And I receive new life in Christ.
every head bowed and eye closed, we said that for the first time, or maybe the first time in a long time. If you want to go ahead and signify by raising your hand, I'd love to pray for you in this moment. And we've got also a starter pack we'd love to put in your hand. Every head bowed and eye closed. Go ahead and put your hand up right now. God, we just pray and thank you for your presence. We thank you for your love that is unchangeable, that is uh, deeply committed and can never let us down. Just pray and thank you for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're going to move on, on into a time of worship. Uh, it's going to be communion at the front. It's going to be prayer at the back. I've got some guys who would love to pray with you. And uh, if you're a believer, I'd love to invite you to come forward and partake in communion from the first row. Uh, and then following with the second and the third. Um, so let's go ahead and worship.
God, just pray and thank you for holy ground, God, in our hearts and in this place. God, we thank you for your, your word and your message. Just pray, Father, you help us to love better. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you may go ahead and be seated. I'm gonna move on into a time where we get to worship with our giving. I'm gonna invite my lovely wife up. She didn't want me to say that. Thank you, lovely husband. <laughs> Good morning, guys. My name is Anna, and Phil invited me today to share my giving story with you. So my giving story goes the whole way back when I was a little girl, and my mom and dad would always give me some pocket money to bring to the mass to give to the church. So I guess this was my parents' way to teaching me how to be generous. But I never really connected with it because it was never my own sacrifice. It was a sacrifice of my parents. And I was just passing on the money from my parents to the church. And being honest, the money sometimes would make its way. Kids, close your ears, please. The money sometimes would make its way to the church, but sometimes it would make its way to the shop. And I would buy myself sweets or ice cream. And only until many years later when I got saved and I became a Christian and I started reading Bible, I discovered the principle of tithing. And I didn't want to really believe that this is something biblical. I wanted to believe this is something ancient from Old Testament. And I, I knew in my heart that it was the right thing to do, but I tried to find evidence that tithing is not biblical, and I failed. So I decided to obey God and give my 10% of my salary to church. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't like the idea of doing, doing it. I couldn't imagine myself doing it for the rest of my life. I was worried about my finance, but I've done it anyway. And it took me a few months to actually become a cheerful giver. And that was through the amazing testimonies in our church, through all the fruit our church is producing. And I became proud to be a part of it. Um, and at the end of the day, all the blessings I have, all the resource I have comes from God. And I'm still passing it on in the same way when I was a little girl. And why would I limit God's blessing over my life for from holding on to something that is not mine in the first place so guys if giving is something you would like to participate in today there are two ways to give firstly you can give online there's a video going to be played on the screen very shortly secondly you can give in person there's a box at the exit there where you can leave your donation and one more thing i would like to mention as well is with the latest situation in U ukraine i'm polish and i'm following all my friends in Poland, people that are opening their houses for the refugees, people are giving and donating abundantly. And refugee centers and donation centers are now overflowing. People are being turned away because there's too much things to give, but we can still give to the people that are in Ukraine. There are transports every day sent, buses, big, big buses, big massive lorries sent every day to Ukraine to help the soldiers, to help the people that decide not to flee. And our church will partner with one of the churches in Poland that is participating in that, and we can give financially to support. And one pound in here goes the whole way longer in Ukraine, trust me. So th thank you so much for your attention and turn your attention to the screen. Thank you.
afternoon, church. Lovely to see you all out today. Um, for those who don't know me, my name's Rachel, and I serve on the welcome team here at R8. So anyone that's joining with us for the first time today, either online or in person, you are very, very welcome. It is great to have you here today. Um, I just wanted to finish today with a few announcements. Um, so firstly, there is no group this week, um, but that will be back next week again. If you are not part of a group here at R8, then there's loads of information online on the R8 website, so check it out and get in contact if you would like to join a group with us. Um, secondly, then we have Alpha tonight, it's week two. Um, so tonight it's gonna be covering the topic of who Jesus is and why did he have to die? So it's gonna be a really, really amazing night. There's gonna be free pizza again. So um, do come along for that. There's gonna be great chat, great conversation. Um, if you haven't um, joined already um, or booked a place, then just um, go to the Eventbrite link on Instagram and book in just so we know that we can get enough pizza ordered for you as well. Um, and everyone is welcome to that, so please do come. Um, thirdly then, we have youth on Friday night again, but this week it's just gonna be the one group, seven to 8.30, um, and Rachel McGammon is gonna be sharing her testimony and talking about her book, Fiery Hearts, um, and there'll be an opportunity for the youth to buy the book there as well on that night, so that'll be great child dedications next Sunday. So if you have a child that you want to get dedicated, please do get in contact with Phil um, and we'll get that sorted for you. And uh, finally then, um, crash. Yeah, so there's help needed in crash. So um, the numbers are growing and growing in crash, which is amazing to see but it just means that um, they're very, very stretched there. So if you could serve even one week out of six weeks, it would be an amazing help. So um, please do speak to Rachel if you could do that, if you could support there. If you haven't already, join us on social media because that's where you're gonna get up to date with everything that's going on in the church. Um, but except for that, that's everything for today. Um, parents, if you can come up, line up, down the middle here behind the stand and we will get your kids back to you as soon as possible but except for that have a great week guys and hope to see you tonight